Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to vlog two, three, five. <laughs> Who are the most difficult PhD students to supervise? So let me tell you how we got here. We had a wonderful PhD student, Liam, and Liam finished that great PhD and he's managed to gain a contract post. You rock, Liam. So I'm currently training Liam to be a PhD supervisor. And after one of these trainings, Liam asked me an incredibly complex, powerful question. Tara, who are the most difficult PhD students to supervise? This is a, a great question, particularly for Liam moving from his student identity to a supervisory identity. Liam, great man. So to answer Liam's question, I thought it might be honest and robust and accountable to share those answers with you. This is a, a tough vlog to hear. Right, so students will blame supervisors, librarians, statisticians, their partner, their parents, often their mother and their children if they can. And I get that because it is tough to look in the mirror. I really grasp that. But can I just say, and not much surprises me at this juncture of my professional life, but the research I conducted for this vlog shocked me. Okay, so into Google I go, before I go to Google Scholar, let me just get the vibe. I put in, through a series of phrases, bad PhD supervisors, into Google. Hang on to yourself. 10.2 million returns emerged from those search tools. 10.2 million. Okay. Right, and so then I did a parallel search, bad PhD students. Hang on yourself. 788 returns. Not million, 788 returns, full stop. So, and even of those 788, a lot of those articles started with, let me tell you about poor PhD students, but end up talking about the supervisors as well. Okay, so firstly, what we learn from this astonishing search is, one, there are a lot of bad PhD supervisors, certainly, tick. The second thing we learn is people like to talk about a lot uh, really bad PhD supervisors, they talk about it a lot. Now, we know by the international literature that 50% of students that start a PhD don't finish, 40% of students change one or more of their supervisors or advisors on the way through. So I understand what's occurring here, but to try and enable a supervisor's perspective, I had to go to some very unusual sources and material. So I end up going to ombudsman reports and complaints to ombudsman. I went to union documents, I went to graduate associations, and I went to blogs from supervisors often at the end of their career. So firstly what we learned from this, and wow it surprised me, so firstly what we learned from this is <laughs> Some serious lessons about online research. So, of course, I've written books about this, Digital Hemlock, the University of Google, Digital Dieting. So we learn a lot about online research here because Google does confuse the popular and the accurate, the popular and the relevant, the popular and the important. So if we are to believe Google, then every single student, PhD student, is a remarkable scholar a brilliant researcher, outstanding, motivated, clear in their life goals. And every supervisor is a combination of, let's say, Hannibal Lecter and pick a wicked queen or stepmother from a Disney movie. Now, you might believe that. You might be in a space where you believe that, that you agree with the Google algorithm. But this vlog does offer an alternative view and occupies an alternative space. And look, you might not be in a place mentally or intellectually or emotionally today to hear this vlog. And that's cool. Just forget about this one and I'll see you next week for a more positive gig. But if you are prepared to have a go, 
and look in the mirror and accompany me through this pretty uncomfortable vlog, let's do this. And we're going to hear some radically different truths about the supervisory space. And look, there are three pivot points in supervision where supervisors decide to walk away from the student for many reasons, but there are three pivot points. Firstly, before the PhD supervision even starts. So a lot of students, I'm talking hundreds, hundreds of students email me from around the world and say, I just can't get a supervisor to take me on or an advisor to take me on. No one will admit me to their university. So clearly something's happening at the start. Supervisors are seeing something that is worrying them. We'll be talking about that today. Then there is that midpoint, that really pretty dodgy point that is clearly a crisis point for students and for supervisors. So you've got through the confirmation of candidature, so you're sort of okay, the project is okay, but then halfway through you haven't kicked on and the supervisor starts to worry. They state in the literature that you haven't developed independent research and I'll use the quote, quote, we feel like we're doing your thesis for you, end of quote. So that's the crunchy point in the middle. And then there is the nightmare, the crisis point at the end, so the final three to six months. Can I say as Dean, these are the worst cases to manage, but I absolutely understand how they emerge, okay? What happens in these cases is the supervisor hangs on as long as they can. So the student says, I'm going to be submitting in three months, I'm going to be submitting in six months. And of course the three months or the six months becomes a year, 18 months or two years. And the supervisor thinks they can maybe just hold it together, but the supervisor, sorry, the student doesn't present the work, doesn't present the work, doesn't present the work, and at a certain point, and every supervisor has a different point, they've had it. They've had it. And can I also say there's another remarkable group of supervisors who hang on right through the end and drag a student over the line, right? And that's remarkable. Well, the student just doesn't want to submit, and it's the supervisor that gets that student over the line. But it was so painful, distressing, and disturbing that they have nothing to do with the student after the examination. And in fact, I've worked with some of our colleagues this week in that particular sociological cohort and they're so burnt by the experience they really don't want to take any new students on. Okay, so as you can see these are tough stories that I'm telling today but I need to put some meaning, some interpretation, some texture around these stories because we can keep blaming the supervisors, really easy to do. Students blame the supervisor, Google <laughs> blames the supervisor or we can actually unpick that a little bit and understand what's happening in this space. And also remember, I have a very skewed rendering of this tale, so I need to acknowledge my lens here. Since 2012, which is a long time ago, most of my supervisions, like 98% of them, have been what's called rescue supervisions. So in other words, a supervisor has walked away from these students, and my role as dean, or in my former roles as head of school, or head of department, around the world, I've had to try and get these students through. Now, I have never and will never create a culture of blame around either the student or the supervisor, because blame is pointless. It is about understanding what happened in the past, putting a line through that past, and trying to move to the future. So therefore, I have some very clear insider knowledge, that's a rare knowledge base, about what is happening in this complicated space. So Liam, Thank you for being you. Let's ask this really tough question as you move from student to supervisor. Who are the most difficult students to supervise? Let's do this. One, and this is going to be painful, but let's, just, let's go through it together. One, students who make excuses. Can I say as Dean, let alone as supervisor, these are the most challenging students to help or to work with. Let me tell you what happens students at some point in their candidature send me a two-page email or longer and in that email they list everything that has gone wrong in their entire supervision. They blame the peers, their lab mates who are supposedly hampering their work, their supervisor doesn't understand them, their family often gets an array of blame structures as well through this email. So what's happening 
in a case such as this is students are just cataloguing their excuses. Everybody else is involved in why they haven't been successful. And that is blocking them from looking in the mirror and questioning themselves. Is my work rate of a high enough level? Am I motivated? Am I committed to what I'm doing here? Or am I waiting for somebody else to do this work for me? Okay, this is very challenging for me and it's very hard to help and enable this group of students. They are the most difficult group of students to help. Because if they're going to finish, and it's a big if, if they're going to finish, then they need to have that crystalline moment of recognition that the buck stops with them. It also suggests probably, and we, we might do a future vlog on this, the students hadn't enacted enough preparation going into the PhD, so they were underprepared going in and then chasing their tail. That's probably right. And, you know, there's no recognition that no research project goes smoothly. The nature of research is you don't know where it's going, that's why it is research. So therefore, their inability to manage project difficulties or when something goes wrong, that resilience, I'll use the word, but it's really the capacity to something's gone wrong, how do I handle it? Do I go something's gone wrong and I'll fix it or something's gone wrong and I'll put excuses around it? Decide who you are. So great PhDs are created through persistence and through endurance. It's not really simply or only about talent or about intelligence. Intelligence is great, it's actually about endurance. And an excuse culture is one of the truly enormous blockages to a successful PhD candidature. And this is particularly important for supervisors. The research has shown here that if a supervisor has a very bad experience with a student in honours or in a capstone project in North America, particularly with regard to excuses, so they had an earlier experience of the student with supervision, and the excuses, excuses, excuses occurred, then what does happen, and the students go, but we got on so well, and the supervisor actually does not supervise them to PhD because they saw they weren't managing the culture, they were using excuses at honours or a capstone level, and they're not prepared to take you through to a PhD. So the key to avoid making excuses is very easy series of strategies. To avoid dealing with excuses, call the problem early, this has occurred. Speak the words, this has occurred, and then immediately say, this has occurred, how will I fix it? So it doesn't allow it to fester or get big or allow your brain to sort of create narratives about everything that's going wrong in your life. So excuses are not necessary if you name and address the problem. Two, blame. After excuses, the most challenging students to supervise are those that blame. Supervisors walk away from these students because they just cannot get them to focus on their research. The reason for these issues, I think, is that students are displacing all their problems onto others. So something bad happens in their life, something bad happens in their research, they blame the supervisor. That's the jump. Something happens, it's the supervisor's fault. And can I say, while I was doing the research for this vlog, this very strange research, remember the 10 million plus articles that I found on bad PhD supervisors? Well, when I read those articles, it was interesting that a sort of sub-genre that emerged from the selection I read was, you've guessed it, when in doubt, blame the supervisor. Okay, so now I'm sure, I'm really sure, there are millions of supervisors who are worthy of that blame. But if your supervisor ever says to you, this is your thesis, with multiple intonations, this is your thesis, this is your thesis, if they're saying that to you, you need to take a breath and have a think, because the chances are you're a blamer. And the supervisor is just trying to reconnect you and remind you that you've guessed it, it is your thesis and that you are accountable and you are responsible for your actions. So the question you have to ask if you've recognised this in yourself, and this is hard yakker, I know that, but if you've gone, wow, I do do that, the next question for you is, how is this blame serving me? So, okay, I'm using blame. 
what is the blame doing for me? And try and answer that question. How are you using blame? You can only stop blame if you understand how you are using it. And you focus on you, you focus on your research, you focus on your progression. Three, missing deadlines. Well, the big ten are here, yep. So these are the most challenging students that supervisors have to manage. And this is where they, they walk away. Supervisors walk away pretty quickly. So academics right now, and I mean right now, COVID right now, are busier than they have ever been. The economic problems that universities are going through at the moment means that supervisors, academics, have less support than they've ever had. So this means that undergraduate teaching is incredibly tough incredibly tough. Grant money is harder to get than ever before because there is less grant money. And publishing is very unstable. Academics have KPIs. We need to produce a number of articles, books, book chapters, etc. every year. And publishing is unstable. Some journals are operating magnificently with incredible credit to all our colleagues out there. Some journals are just not producing. So academics have committed to that journal, put in a refereed article, and it's slow. So you can see the problem that's going on. And it's no surprise that the word crisis is being used and used and used and used when we're talking about higher education at the moment. So you might rightly say, well, how does this impact on me, Tara? How is this impacting on me? Well, the answer is your supervisor is trying to shield you from the brutality of higher education at the moment. They, we are trying to sort of keep the really bad stuff away from you. But the problem is we have less flexibility and dexterity to do so. So when you say you're going to deliver work at a particular time, please deliver it. And look, I'll tell you why. I'll try and use a, a personal example so you can understand what's going on here. So when a student says to me, I am going to deliver this chapter, this entire thesis, this component of writing to you, I clear an afternoon and make alternative arrangements. So I think, right, well, I've got to read 100,000 words. If I'm really going for it, if I've got an afternoon and an all-nighter, I've got a chance of getting through it, okay? So what happens is my calendar from 12 noon gets cleared. Everyone that would like to see me, those meetings have been put to other times because you are the priority, okay? So plenty of people are inconvenienced so that we can give you your feedback, so we can do that work for you. Now, of course, if the work doesn't arrive, we've always got work that can fill the time, so work didn't arrive, okay, so work floods in, that's fine, but then if you decide to deliver that work a day later, two days later, a week later, Friday at 5 p.m., we don't have the flexibility that we had if you delivered it when you said you would deliver it. And staff report, and obviously this is my personal experience as well, students send a draft at 11 p.m. or midnight or 2 a.m. or 9 a.m. and expect that to have been read to discuss at a 10 a.m. meeting and students are disappointed when we haven't read that piece of work yet. And of course this is common behaviour and this can make academics, can make faculty angry, upset, despairing, and indeed just going, you know what, I've really had enough. So just remember that academics have an incredibly full Microsoft calendar, and they're asking you when you're going to deliver the work so that they can actually make arrangements to try and read that work for you. And if you don't deliver, you're not simply inconveniencing yourself. You're not simply inconveniencing your supervisor, but all the people who had to be rescheduled to get that work back to you. So we absolutely understand that life happens, but you need to understand that a PhD is a relationship. And yes, there's you, and you are incredibly important, but the success of a PhD is not determined by you or by the supervisor, but by the calibre of the relationship. So make that relationship one of trust and respect. Four, emotional volatility and carelessness. Wow, now this one I wasn't expecting. This one particularly emerged from colleagues in the lab-based sciences. How interesting is this? And they were very concerned, and large sections of supervisors in lab-based sciences were concerned about carelessness in lab safety, 
carelessness in recording results with lots of stuff happening around lab books, can I say, and securing results for the integration with other data sets. Wow. So as you can see, record keeping, note taking, absolutely integral research skills, crucial to academic integrity, research integrity. But the emotional volatility was seen to be involved in all of this. The difficulty in managing PhD students because of, and I'll use a quote from one supervisor, the interpersonal, interpersonal dramas, end of quote interpersonal dramas. So I dug into that phrase a bit because what actually does it mean? And the supervisors were concerned that students were not learning skills to de-escalate arguments, to interact civilly with people that you don't like, or stopping these weird warfare scenarios with the peers in the lab, right? So as an example, and this is a shocker, it's really upset me this week when I, when I was reading this and I reported it in the blog. So there's an example of a PhD student who decided to use the lab budget to buy a lab grade blender to take home and make margaritas, laughing that the supervisor wouldn't notice. But of course the other lab mates saw it talking, 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 and so the supervisor sent an email to that student at 4.45 on Friday saying at 9am on Monday morning uh, he needs to see how that <laughs> blender is being used in his research. Okay. This upset me for a lot of reasons, I think, this, this story. Firstly, it's, it's sort of treating a lab like a frat party which upset me enough. But the PhD is conducted in a workplace. A university, it's not your home, it's not your family. You are spending public money. That's Australian, in that case, North American taxpayers' money that you've decided, I'm going to buy myself a margarita machine. Are you kidding me? Right. So just because you don't like a fellow PhD student, just because you think your supervisor is a bit of a gal, <laughs> all of that's actually irrelevant because this is a professional relationship, this is a professional workplace. So the supervisors are really focused on this. Please keep your emotional life in check. Yes, terrible things happen and your supervisor will be there for you. But if your life is becoming like bold and the beautiful, right, how many times does Ridge have to dump Brooke before she realises he's just not that into her? Okay. Similarly, if you're a door slammer and you start to frighten your supervisor a bit, the relationship is not going to end well. So I understand dreadful things happen. Your supervisor understands dreadful things happen. But also remember, your supervisors are people. They're humans and they have a life and some terrible things could be happening to them as well and they're just about holding it together they're coming to work and they're trying to hold it together okay and they just might not be available or able to take the burden of your stuff on as well so respect your supervisor it's a workplace be calm five assuming that your supervisor can solve all your personal professional and intellectual problems. Again, this particularly emerged in the hard sciences. Very interesting. So this one seemed to refer from supervisors detailing unrealistic expectations and not managing personal boundaries. Okay, so again, the supervisor can rightly be blamed here, and I do a lot of training around this area, by the way, but the supervisor can rightly be blamed if they haven't set the relationship up properly. Okay, so it needs to be right at the start. But the greatest difficulties emerge in supervisory relationships, the really nasty ones, uh, when the student doesn't know or doesn't want to know the limits of that relationship. So these are the situations where the student gets a bit confused and start to think that the supervisor is their mum, their dad, their boyfriend, their girlfriend, their significant other, or their friend. What a mess. So it's worth every minute that you spend at the start of supervision to work out your limitations, but also that you understand the supervisor's limitations as well. Talk overtly about the relationship between the personal and the professional. And I've never limited 
the relationships with my students more than I do right now. I limit it by time and interfaces. I keep these relationships very tight now. And it's sad, I get that. But students have their meetings and they don't have my mobile phone number. They can't contact me on the weekend. You know, all that stuff's over. And they never see me anywhere except my office. And that's the nature of the relationship. That's the deal. If you want me to supervise you, that's the deal. But Liam, can I say the students that I find the most challenging are those who assume a level of intimacy that just doesn't exist. And, you know, I have students that have gone through their candidature and I've got them through, but they've just made the most dreadful assumptions about me, about other people, about my friends, my family. It's just got yucky. And at the end of the thesis, I got them through, but I just had to sever all ties because it just got so horrible okay so what i'd advise is that you as a student we as supervisors recognize that it takes a village to supervise a phd student so select your village a supervisor is not a village okay so put librarians in your village professional staff put your friends your major have a coffee with down at the coffee shop writing groups lab mates okay gather up a community and differentiate your functions so that you receive that support through multiple channels. If you put all your eggs in that supervisory basket, those eggs are going to get broken. So spread your support. Six. Oh yeah. Wow. Thinking that a PhD is a continuation of an undergraduate degree, which is a continuation of school. There has to be a break, an intellectual and personal rupture, if you will, that allows a recalibration of a student's supervisory relationship. So there needs to be that break and the recalibration between an undergraduate degree and a doctorate. If they blur, if they sort of run together, that does not end well. Students end up just overwhelmed and a hint of what supervisors has to have described as, quote, a do the work for me attitude, end of quote. So that means start of a PhD and orientation is required. So that the standards of behaviour, research, what this degree is going to look like, that all of those are clear. And you see, that's why there are so many problems. Wow. When a student decides to continue the research, and it's very common, but continue the research from honours to a PhD or a capstone project through to a doctorate, okay? Now, this may seem like a no-brainer. I've talked to these students. It's like, oh, right, well, I did all this research in honours, so this will give me a flying start. Wrong. What happens is the students cruise into a PhD. It doesn't allow them to realise that the PhD is at a different level. So they keep going at sort of this undergraduate honours level. They're not able to jump methodologically at all. And they're unable to reboot the relationship with the supervisor in a different way. Yeah. Seven. Incapacity to self-manage. Now, success requires planning in life, we know that. And the PhD is a marathon of planning. Consistency is the characteristic of successful students. And this is a crucial attribute, can I say, for me when I'm thinking about taking on a PhD student these days. Can they manage themselves? So what this means is, can a student manage goals and motivations, objective, schedules, commitments. If there is a meeting, are they going to arrive at that meeting on time? For someone like me, my schedule has a meeting every 30 minutes. So if a student arrives seven minutes late, they get 23 minutes, full stop. So do they meet a deadline? Can the student manage, but also anticipate and prevent problems? And if a problem happens, do they look in the mirror and handle it themselves? Can they think ahead? Can they ask if they need any help? Are they strong communicators? So good students, the great students, know their strengths and know their weaknesses and develop knowledge to enhance both. Eight, lack of reading and research. <laughs> wow, I have put the list together today, can I say. This is actually the major variable I look for. When I'm looking at a PhD student, 
this is my number one draft pick. Are they innovative researchers? And what I mean by that is, do they hold information literacy? Do they have the vocabulary to manage complex searches? Do they have a willingness and a respect for librarians to learn the research skills, whether it be scoping reviews, systematic reviews, integrated literature reviews? Do they understand the difference? So this is, as you can see, not a question of intelligence, but of curiosity and skill and literacy. So let me explain the frustration here. And this happens to me every single day. Every single day. It'll happen to me in the next hour once I turn this camera off. So I have students, not always mine. They can be Flinders University students, students from around the world. And they say to me, Tara, there's nothing on this topic. Okay? Now, I've only heard about their topic from them as they've been talking to me in this room. I turn to the screens behind me, I go to Google Scholar, I put in the keywords that they've given me during the five minute conversation, and I find 1200 plus searches on that topic in 2020 alone. And this happens so often, I just wonder what is occurring, right? So either, what's going on here? The student hasn't bothered to do a search, they haven't bothered, so therefore there's nothing because they haven't looked. Secondly, they lack the vocabulary to find the best keywords. Thirdly, they're just not interested in engaging with librarians. And fourthly, they haven't worked on their information literacy. Now, it's one of those. It could be all of them. And that, for me, is my deal breaker. Nine, carelessness in writing. Now, we all know that you learn to write by writing, but the most challenging students are the ones where, and look, I'll speak on behalf of all the supervisors out there, I am going to go there, where we offer track change after track change after track change because we're trying to teach you how to enact academic writing, model academic writing for you, and what you do in draft after draft after draft is just accept change accept change. So the only improvements you've made are the ones that we've tracked into your document and you haven't learnt from it or enhanced it. And that happens draft after draft, year after year. And this means you're not lifting. You continue to produce academic writing that's pretty mediocre right till the end. So we all know that first drafts are terrible. That's why they're first drafts. But recognise that anybody that says I do my best work at the last minute or I thrive under pressure. If you're on a PhD stu student using this type of language, uh, <laughs> you're not going to make it because you won't produce your best work at the last minute. This is a slog. This is hard yakka. Now I do think this problem is getting worse. As I've often talked about with you all, I now have to put student work through a spelling checker. Every student every student's work through a spelling checker before I can even get to the substantive structure and content. So work has been submitted to a supervisor with spelling errors all the way through. So it takes me about two hours to do a 95,000 word PhD, right? Because before I've even done any drafting at all, I have to put a spelling checker through it first. Now look, I'm cool with that because I'm having to do rescue supervision, so my only job is to get that student through, okay? So I could go bonkers about it and go, imagine giving this to a dean, you know, spelling errors all the way through. But actually, at this point, not bothered. I'll do the spelling check just to make sure the examiner doesn't have to correct those spelling errors. What's worse than a supervisor doing it? The examiner doing it. And trust me, they will. So as you can see, some problematic issues are emerging with writing. But I argue that problematic writing is a proxy for other issues. So if you're saying I've got problems with my writing, can we just go through what else might be going wrong, okay? You might just be not hugely motivated. You might be lacking commitment or you might be frightened. All of those are legitimate, but recognize is the writing suffering because you're frightened or you're lacking motivation? Also, you won't take advice from your supervisor. So if you think, we well, said, if you think that you're better than your supervisor, so oh, they think oh, I'm better writer than that. That's okay. That's great. So say that. Go, actually, I think I'm a better writer than, than you are, Phil. With the greatest respect, Phil, thanks for the track changes, but really I'm a, I'm a better writer than you. So be honest. And if you think it, say it. So at least the supervisor knows, well, 
Okay, there's the reason, fine. Um, the other issue is you won't communicate with your supervisor. So you might be frightened or worried or stuff's going on and you just decide you're not going to have that communication with them about it. So it creates this sort of freeze and the relationship breaks down. Or you lack independence. That's another one that we're seeing too. So you rely on the supervisor to, again, drag you over the line, that it suddenly becomes the supervisor's thesis. So you might lack time management skills, so you're doing all the research and the writing is rushed and you slam it to your supervisor to meet the deadline, but that shows you're lacking time management skills or indeed you're procrastinating. So you muck about and then all of a sudden it's like, really, really, really? Okay, so work out what is happening with your writing. Work out if it is your writing or it's something else. That's really important. If that's all you get out of the vlog today, we're winning. If it is something else, then address the something else. You know, talk to your supervisor, engage counselling, engage librarians, information literacy skills, work out what it is. Ten, not taking risks or asking questions. This was a big one. I wouldn't have come up with this. This was brilliant. So students are creating delays in their own progress. And the argument is, brilliant I thought, the argument is that students are not asking clear questions at the start of this particular section of their research. Again, we saw this particularly in the lab-based sciences. So that means they're not clear about what they're doing before they enact the next stage of their research. So they're not prepared to take the next step in the lab or in field work or in the archive. So supervisors report incredible frustration of checking with their students that they understand all the terms. So the supervisor thinks they're leaving the office and they understand what's happening, they understand the next step, everything's cool. So everybody thinks we're cool. And then two weeks later, the student returns to see the supervisor and nothing's been done because the student said they didn't understand what they were being asked to do. Now again, you can blame the supervisor for that because they, we, didn't check enough that the student understood what was happening, okay? We as teachers can never actually know though what a student does not know. We can't know what's happening in your brain, we can't. You can't know what another human is thinking. And that's why undergraduates have assessment so we can check if a first year, a second year, a third year knows what's going on by giving them an assessment so we test it, okay? But with a PhD, there's very little scaffolding assessment, okay? So the time that's lost if a student and a supervisor, either party, we're not clear, we're not overt, we're not honest, we're not using the meetings well. Put another way, deal with problems immediately. Ask the questions. Don't leave the room until you are clear. So ensure that each stage of the project is well defined. You know what you have to do. Be clear and then we're winning. Also make sure that the relationship with the supervisor evolves and changes as your project develops. So I've always argued, one day I might actually write this up, but actually the relationship between the student and the supervisor there's about eight different supervisors you have on the way through. There's the one that you start with and the one that you're in with, and they're not the same person. So about eight different roles are needed for a supervisor. And the best relationships acknowledge all these different changes and shifts. So it's great to be overt and clear as the relationship is changing. At each stage, what the supervisor is after is that you increase your risk taking and you evolve your relationship with your supervisor by asking clear and overt questions. So remember, there is no such thing as silly questions. There's no silly question. There's just silly people that won't answer it for you, okay? Now, I know this week has been confronting, and I know when I wrote it, I thought, oh, gee, that's hard, that's tough, but that honesty, I think, is important. And it's a very interesting vlog to write because it's so countervailing of the existing literature about when in doubt, blame the supervisor. But the problem with that narrative, when in doubt, blame the supervisor, is it's not actually honest for students. It's not honest for you. And that's why so many students, when a supervisor walks away from the relationship, they say, but what happened? What, what happened? The answer is one of the 10 things that I've talked about today. Exhaustion 
with one of those 10 variables is what has caused the split in the relationship. Now, thankfully, next week is fabulous and positive. It's the fabulous positive version of what I've done this week because I wanted to talk about the 10 attributes of the great PhD students, and I'm working on that now for you, and that's great. So we will leave the Darth Vader zone and move to Yoda next week. But there's also something powerful in learning from Darth. I wish you love, light, and peace. Tea out.